Okay. Um, All right. Good evening, or good evening. Good, or good morning, wherever you're connecting from. Uh, ah. My name is Erwin Kyungson. I am a board member of the RMC Foundation and co-founder of the Philippines on the Potomac Project. We have an hour for this program. We will have the welcome remarks, a 30-minute presentation, followed by Q&A. There are about 220 people registered to attend this event. Uh, some 72 people are connected right now. I should actually say 72 households uh, because obviously uh, we have more than 72 people actually connected. So uh, 72 households currently connected out of the 220 or something expected. So we would like to announce some guidelines to make this easier and a more pleasant experience for everyone. To preserve bandwidth, we are keeping everyone on mute. I hope that's okay. And uh, please turn off your videos. When we get to the Q&A, please submit your question through the chat function. You can find the chat function right below the screen. Our moderator will then read the question in the order in which they appear. Or he might call on you to ex uh, ask you to explain further as necessary. We are recording this session. Uh, we will be sending you a link to the recording as soon as it becomes available. I will now introduce our speakers. Uh, the welcome remarks will be given by Rita Kakas. Rita is founder and president of the Rita M. Kakas Foundation. She is a native Washingtonian and daughter of one of the Depression era pioneers. She is author of Images of America, Filipinos in Washington, D.C together with Juanita Tamayo Lot. I think Juanita is joining us as well. Rita worked at the National Gallery of Art and at the U.S. National Archives for nearly 40 years and retired recently. Our moderator this evening is Professor Rodney Obiyan. He is archivist of Keene State College and associate professor in the Information Studies and the MA in History and Archives program. He serves as treasurer and board member of the RMC Foundation. Finally, our main presenter is Professor Ricardo Lim. Ricky is professor and former dean of the Asian Institute of Management. He specializes in design thinking, quantitative analysis, and operation. He is visiting professor in academic institutions in Japan and Malaysia and has served as president or officer of numerous academic and professional organizations, including as president of a consortium of 60 Asia-Pacific business schools. Before joining the academe, he worked for many years in the private sector in Boston, Chicago, Manila, and New York. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Ricky. We are so excited. So Rita, uh, the screen is now yours. Thank you, Erwin. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. We're so delighted that you're here with us today and hope that you and your families are staying healthy and safe. Good evening and happy Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Tonight, we are celebrating a little slice of Washington, D.C. Filipino American history. As we have always done at our Astoria events, we dedicate today's program Today, we remember our friend and supporter, Mitzi Picard, who passed away last month. Mitzi was the longtime president of the Philippine Arts, Letters, and Media Council. Under Mitzi's leadership, Palm collaborated with us in 2016 to obtain a bronze plaque to recognize the former historic Manila House building on K Street. Thank you, Palm, and rest in peace, dear Mitzi. In a moment of shameless self-promotion, Many of you know about this book, Filipinos in Washington, D.C., which was published in 2009. My co-author Juanita Tamayo Lot is registered to be with us. Juanita, can you believe that our book has been out for 10 years? Congrats to us. The foundation was established five years ago. Our mission is to document, preserve, and share the history of Washington, D.C. area Filipinos. This might be accomplished through studies and presentations by students, professional researchers, historians, or authors, or in our case today, by a family member who wants to share the important legacy of his ancestors through their saved letters, photographs, and connected histories. You'll meet him very shortly. 
Our annual series, Historia DC, included themes about DC Filipino food, dance, music, and theater, and historic World War II figures and events. I was so excited to learn that some of our past speakers and many guests are here with us today. We canceled many events this year because of the coronavirus pandemic, but we have found a way for Historia DC to live on. I want to quickly thank our event sponsors. I'm grateful to Erwin and Tichi Tiongson of the Pop DC Project. They are also on the Foundation Board of Directors, as Erwin mentioned. Thank you both for envisioning and taking the lead in organizing the Astoria DC online series. Many thanks to the Philippine Embassy and its Central Rizal program for hosting today's and our past Astoria DC events. As always, we thank our friends at the US Philippine Society for attending and co-sponsoring co our events as well. And in observing Memorial Day this week, we have a special shout out to the historic VFW Post 5471. Many of its members have joined us today. We thank you for your service and for co-sponsoring today's event as well. The VFW Post 5471 was created shortly after World War II to honor General Douglas MacArthur and General Vicente Lim, who was the grandfather of our featured speaker today. Professor Ricardo Lim. I'd like to quickly share with you an important photograph preserved in the Filipino American Community Archives at the University of Maryland Libraries in College Park, Maryland. This is a souvenir photo of the BFW Post 5471 at their New Year's Eve celebration in 1958 held at the Presidential Arms Hotel in Washington, D.C. We met with Professor Lim a couple of weeks ago when he shared with us some highlights of his presentation, delightful photographs, love stories, and other memories of his family. Ricky has also graciously donated digital images of his fam family photographs used in his presentation today to the archives, and we want to express our sincerest appreciation and thanks for this important donation. So you, as you watch and listen to this presentation, think about your own family's historic photographs and DC Philippine stories and consider donating them to the archives. You might even volunteer to share your family's Washington DC story at a future Historia DC online event. Please send us a note in the chat box or contact us by email at wdcfilipinosemail.com, which will also be provided in the chat notes. I'm so excited for you to hear Ricky's story. So let's move on to the program. Thank you and enjoy. All yours, Ricky. Um. Ricky, you're, you're on mute. Thank you again, sorry, false start. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, thank you to RMC, to Rita, Pop DC, the FW5471, uh, US Philippine Society, and other sponsors of this event tonight. I, I am truly honored to be here. Give me a few seconds while I share my, my PowerPoint. And I promise this will be no uh, longer than 30 minutes. Huh? Okay. I hope everybody can see that. Is that cool? Rita, Irwin, is it the full screen? Yes. Uh, well, not the full screen, um, but we can see your PowerPoint. Ah, okay. Uh, hmm. I hope everybody can see. Please uh, yeah. chat. Yeah. Hold on a sec. Huh? Let me just test it. Well, uh, my name is Ricky Lin. I am the uh, grandson of Vicente E. Lim from Laguna, Pilar Hidalgo from Buwak Marinduque, uh, the son of Louis Lim. Uh, his signature is here in the uh, upper left that you see in the flyer. And my mother is Estefania Aldaba. Her signature is here. She's from Malolos, uh, Bulacan. And today's talk, my talk today is, is, a, is a love story. 
No? It's a love story uh, between my mom and my dad. And also a love story for Washington, D.C. This was a letter written in 1951, eight years after my father met my mom in D.C. No? My dearest, I am sitting in the triangle opposite the Chalfont near 16th Street. The Chalfont is an apartment building still there. It's on Argonne. Okay. I have one half hour before I see Jean. Jean is the wife of Nano Iranya. Nano and Jean were in apartment 321 of the Chalfont, and that's where my mom and dad met. So he was visiting Jean, who, according to my father, was a, a real exciting driver. Sorry, because she would pick DC corners on two wheels. So he was terrified whenever uh, he had to ride with my, uh, she ha he had to ride with, with Jean. Yeah. To give you a background though, let me take you back 40 years. And this is my dramatic fade to white, uh, 40 years before this event. And this is my a picture of, uh, from the West Point uh, yearbook of 1914. My grandfather, Vicente P. Lim. Uh, if you notice here at the bottom, they misspelled Laguna uh, at the time. They, Typesetter probably didn't know that there was a place called Lajma or Laguna, so he put Lajma down. More tellingly, they called the general cannibal. Uh, in those days, and let me move my screen because I, I cannot see my own screen. In those days, uh, we were a new colony. So America thought of us very innocently as being uh, bolo wielding cigar, uh, cigar smoking savages. Yeah. So the word cannibal was really meant as camaraderie. It wasn't malicious. It was just at the time from ignorance. Yeah? Today, it would be completely inappropriate. As a point of fact, the second Filipino to graduate from West Point was also called cannibal. They didn't know any better. And then by the third batch, they were called Ralph, Sal, regular names. Yeah? It says here that he was the first West Point uh, graduate from the Philippines. He uh, was an, a never-ending helper, and let me highlight that here, okay, of goats in Spanish. Oh, sorry, wrong color. That goats in the military academy are people at the bottom of the class, and my grandfather excelled in Spanish because that was his first language, having been born in uh, 1888, yeah. Um, story here is that in 1910, he was already over age because he had already graduated from the Philippine Normal School uh, to be a teacher. They asked him to take the, the, the academy exam where his English scores were mediocre, but his math scores were like 99%. So the governor general at the time said, okay, Lim, you can go. But the problem was he was over age. So the governor, governor general decreed that, ah, because of the time it takes for applications to go by boat between Philippines and the US, I hereby declare you to be eligible. So he was the first West Point graduate. In 1914, he left for the Europe to observe the war and he was stranded in Berlin. Uh, from Berlin, he had to take the Trans-Siberian Railway to the Phil to uh, ended up in the port of Dairen, which is now Dailan, the city of Dailan in, in what was once Manchuria. And from there took a boat to probably Yokohama down to the Philippines. No? Ironically, General Lieutenant Lim at the time would meet Japanese officers who would one day face him in the battleship, uh, Battle of Bataan. No? Let's fast forward. This is uh, my grandmother, uh, Pilar Hidalgo. She was a cum laude graduate of the University of the Philippines, one of the first. Uh, when I was a third grade, she would teach me fractions. And I was always wondering, my God, how does she know that? She's, she's a grandmother. How could you know fractions? No? I didn't realize that she was a mathematician first before she was a grandmother. Um, here she is later on with luminaries such as uh, Sofia de Vera. She's in several of the books of uh, Rita. And uh, a figure that we will see later on. Her name is Josefa Lianes Escoda. Oh, sorry, advanced too much. 
she and my grandmother uh, formed the Girl Scouts of the Philippines in 1940. And she will come into play later. Yeah? My grandfather met my grandmother in Baguio in Session Road, courted her, wooed her, married her in 1917. And they produced six children. And the first two you will see here, Fort McKinley in 1921. I'll give you one guess who my father and my uncle were. Uh, he was the only Filipino officer at the time in a, a very white uh, American army. And so he, had, he was billeted in Fort McKinley. This is my, my father and his younger brother, Bobby, who will play a, a role later in our story. So we still have uh, uh, some pictures of this, of this event. It was a birthday party for one of the, the, the children in the, in, the, in the picture. This is my grandmother, Pilar, and grandfather, and the three youngest children, uh, Patricio, he eventually became a priest, and Monsignor, Monsignor Pat, uh, Eulalia, uh, and my youngest, Aunt Maria Bucci, who is the only living, um, my only living relative from that generation. You know? uh, the three oldest sons had by this time gone to America to various schools. Here was my grandfather on the right side. Here he was in 1940. The watermark says it's uh, the fifth anniversary of uh, Commonwealth of the Philippines. And you know who this fellow is? His wife, Doña Aurora, that is Sergio Esmeña, the vice president of the Commonwealth at the time. And very famous fellow here, his wife, Jean, is Douglas MacArthur. At the time, he was a field marshal for the then fledgling Philippine Commonwealth. Uh, you know, contrary to uh, publicity, Douglas MacArthur never liked to smoke pipes. That was just for PR. His real favorite instrument was a Philippine cigar. So when there were no photographers, uh, Douglas MacArthur would smoke cigars. Yeah. So uh, that, at that time, 1940-41, my grandfather had to send his remaining three kids and my Lola uh, to uh, the United States because my aunt Eulalia had polio. Uh, so she needed operations in the United States. So by the time war, was impending in 1941. Uh, Brigadier General Lim, by now Brigadier General Lim of the Philippine Army, they were now they now had their own army, was mustering or gathering the 41st Division in Tagaytay. Uh, this was Tagaytay long before the today where they have hotels and Starbucks cafes. No, it was pristine, and this was where they gathered. You know. Uh, when war came, December 8, 1941, December 7 in Pearl, in Pearl Harbor, uh, the plan was to allow Manila to be an open city. And for all forces, my grandfather was around here below the picture, for all forces to withdraw to a spit of land called Bataan. And there they would resist the Japanese uh, while waiting for American reinforcements. And this area that I shade here uh, is here in this picture. If you can see, that's the area here. And if your eyes are sharp, you can see that the 41st Division was led by Brigadier General Vicente Lim. To his left was the 51st by Albert Jones. He was opposed by the 65th Brigade of uh, General Major General Akira Nara. Okay, this is the fellow that he had been classmates with my grandfather in Fort Benning in George, in uh, I believe it was Georgia. Uh, they were classmates, and that was his opponent. Okay, to the south were Major General Jonathan Wainwright. He eventually surrendered Bataan, and further south, of course, was Corridor, where. MacArthur and Quezon were um, hiding, not hiding, uh, sheltering at the time, yeah? Here's a letter from um, my grandfather to the president, Quezon, and 
it says here, uh, I have continually talked to my officers. I have visited foxholes. I have been urged by my staff and subordinates not to expose myself. So you can be sure that I am not a general who stays in the dugout. This was in veiled reference to Douglas MacArthur, who was nicknamed Dugout Dog at the time. Okay. Um, all the while, this is funny, he was saying, I'm going to continue fighting my dear president, but he's worried about his wife. He says, if I may request you the favor of cabling Mrs. Lim that I am still alive and fighting, but if she needs money, please borrow money from such and such. So President Kesson writes a letter back to uh, uh, Brigadier John saying, I will advance you $2,000 against your future pay. You know, I ordered the Philippine government, so he orders uh, Joaquin Elizalde to please advance the money. In another letter, he, Lim, General Lim says, you know, I bought my, my men cigarettes and uh, cigarettes and food from my own pocket. So please, if you can advance the money, that would be helpful. So it was cute. He was fighting, but at the same time, he was worried about his wife, who was that, then in Los Angeles. No. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Erwin, are you, you still hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Sound check. Okay, just FYI, you're in presentation mode. That's fine, we can see everything, but uh, we can also see the next slide. Oh, you can? Yeah. Oh, oh my. No, Wait it's fine. We can. How's that? No? Anyway, never mind. <laughs> okay, um, fast forward to about. April 1942, April 9th to be precise. Uh, the Japanese forces were just overwhelming and the Philippine and the army, U.S. Army called Yusuf had to surrender. On the right is a picture of my grandfather with Brigadier General Simeon de Jesus of the first constabulary Philippine. On the lower left is my grandfather uh, were operating from a piggery in Abukay, which is where he fought. No? And on the upper right is a picture of General Lim surrendering to the Japanese. Here was the translator, a fellow in glasses. And the Japanese later used this as propaganda that they were treating prisoners of war very civilly. In reality, this was shortly before they made all the men force march called the Bataan Death March from Abukay to San Fernando, Pampanga. It's about 60 kilometers. Uh, from there, they were trained to Kapas Tarlac. So this was, uh, my grandfather went to the Bataan Death March, okay? He was subsequently released uh, and he convalesced at the PGH and tried to escape Manila uh, through a batel, it's a sailing boat, was caught off of Mindoro and incarcerated subsequently in Fort Santiago and the Far Eastern University campus internment camps. He was never heard of again. So uh, I guess the $2,000 of Manuel Quezon went a long way in the future. No? We never heard from him again. And that story comes much later, how we eventually rediscovered him. No? Let's move to the United States. This was my grandmother, Pilar, daughter Maria. Uh, her face is a little distorted there, but I suspect that's my aunt. Uh, Laling, the one suffering from polio, and my uh, father Pat, the priest, yeah. Uh, my grandmother's sister Ursula and her husband, and I believe uh, this is a cousin, Ginny Hidalgo. This was in uh, Rock Creek Park, 18th Street, Mount Pleasant. Um, Tichy and Irvin tracked this down as Rock Creek Park, but I suspect this is near their apartment on 18th Street right above Chalfont, yeah. Um, this was my mother and father. Uh, my father, this dapper man on the right, uh, in 1943 was an engineer uh, working for the Northrop Handy Corporation in El Segundo, California. He was uh, working on jet uh, airplanes where he was known as the nose because of his ability to smell the proper mixture between gasoline and and air, yeah. He was working at the time for Northrop and the Navy Department, yeah. And this was my mom. 
and if she weren't my mom, I would probably call her a hot babe. You know, at the time, she was uh, very svelte. She actually was a, uh, she had a PhD from the University of Michigan in clinical psychology. She was the first clinical psychologist of the Philippines, right? And she was assigned after graduation to Bethesda, Maryland, right? In 1943. Um, there's a picture. This is the first day my mother met my father. This is uh, in a hospital in Washington. Dad, mom, uh, Gloria Cortez, who would later marry Leopoldo Tor Toralbalia. Tor and Gloria would later teach at Princeton and at City University of New York as a mathematician and a organic chemist uh, professors, right? This fellow in the background that you see faded is Jaime Hernandez. He later headed the Philippine government in Washington while Sergio Asmenia was landing in Leyte. Oops, wait a minute. This fellow is Leonides Sarao Virata, Leo Virata. Sarao from Cavite was a famous name of jeepney manufacturers, those beautiful old jeepneys with the flowing uh, uh, memorabilia. Leo Virata was part of the U.S. Embassy. Later, he would be part of the Philippine Commission, where he would actually sign treaties with uh, Truman after the war. Became the chair of the Philippine um, Film Life Insurance Company and uh, Development Bank of the Philippines. A very outstanding uh, man in, in post-war Manila. Yeah. This was the first day they met. They met at the apartment of Jean and Nano Irania. Here's a picture of my uh, father looking very irritated. I don't know why. It was my mother. She was a she was a close friends of her. One of her good friends was Nini Quezon, uh, later Ben Camino and Avancenia. That's Manolo. That's Baby. That's Doña Aurora. This is probably in their apartment. Yeah. So my mother and my father met across the room, and my mother said. That's the man I'm going to marry. My father thought the same way too. So after they, she left the apartment, Jean Aranya told my father, you better chase after that girl, you know. And so he did. Sent her a telegram. Miss E. Aldaba, St. James Hotel, Philadelphia. My mother had to go to Philadelphia for a, a conference. Request pleasure of your company, dinner, Bellevue Stratford. We'll call at 6.30, Lou. Some of you younger people don't know. This is called a, a telegram. They don't have that anymore. They have Instagram now. This is called telegram, yeah? Of course, my mother was so excited. She preserved this telegram all these years, yeah? Uh, my father would write my, my mother, Dear Estefania. Her name was Estefania. And in those chaste days, it was kind of deliciously romantic to say dear Estefania. So my, my mother said, you know, uh, my, my, grand, my father would call long distance from LA and my, my mother said, you know, if I'm gonna marry this man, I better start saving him his long distance calls. And she did marry my father in 1944, 25th November at the Sacred Shrine, Sacred Heart Shrine on 16th Street, right up from Chalfont, yeah? And this was my grandmother, Jaime Hernandez, who gave away the bride, Gloria Cortez, and mom and dad. Yeah? Uh, in, those post, in those war years, the materials were so scarce that my mother uh, made her own dress. She sold her own wedding dress. There wasn't, you know, she didn't have money, but she did have money, I'll, I'll tell you. It, uh, just to give you some information, my, my uncle Bobby, married my aunt, aunt Gloria Mapua after the war in Manila because Manila was so devastated. My aunt Gloria borrowed my, grand, my mother's wedding dress, repassed it, and so the same wedding dress was used for two limbs, yeah? So those were the days you sold your own wedding dress. Uh, there were no uh, wedding coordinators then. You just did it on the fly, yeah? Okay. Um, a little story here. My mother had $245 in savings. 
which she gave to my dad. And the day after the wedding, my dad bought a car, used it all up, you know. So just goes to show you, women, watch out for Filipino men. They're going to spend your money, yeah. But they needed the car to go cross country from Washington to LA where he was working, yeah. Uh, this is a picture, uh, early 1945, perhaps. My uh, son number three of uh, Vicente Lim was Vicente Lim Jr. Tito Ting graduated from West Point like his uh, father. Uh, my father, he was not military, he was the engineer. My son number, son number two of Vicente, uh, Bobby Lim, Roberto. And notice, curiously, he is in an army uniform even if he graduated from Annapolis. He was Annapolis class of 1942, I believe. Yeah? There's a story here. Because he was the son of a missing in action uh, soldier, Vicente Lim, the sons of Vicente Lim were exempt from serving in order to be with their mother, the widow, potentially with our Hidalgo Lim. My uncle Bobby didn't like that, so he resigned his commission from the Navy and rejoined the army in Colorado to train as a B-29 uh, bomber pilot. Uh, Bobby was the closest because he was based out of Guam. And as soon as the war ended, or shortly after Manila was liberated, completely devastated, went to Manila to do two things. No? The second thing was to find out how their house on Vito Cruz was. But the first thing was to find uh, my grandfather. Let me tell you about the second thing first. He found our house in Vito Cruz, but it was intact. Curiously, Vito Cruz was a series of unburned, burned, unburned, burned houses. The Lim house was spared. Why? The Japanese had um, burned every other house, thinking that the wind would just uh, burn every uh, everything, but the wind didn't cooperate, so every other house was spared. Right? But the first objective was to see if uh, my grandfather, where my grandfather was, and he was missing, never to be found, until 50 years later when my uncle met a Nisei, first generation Japanese American, named Richard Sakakida. Sakakida was at, in the war a spy. Uh, for the U.S. Army, but because of his language skills, Sakakida was asked to accompany a truck full of prisoners, including Vicente Lim and Jose Fallianes Escoda. And he witnessed them being brought to Chinese cemetery where they were all beheaded. So we had finally a witness. Uh, they were buried in the mass grave. And we finally had the witness who, who, who pinpointed the whereabouts of my grandfather. Fast forward to 1951 or so. This is my family. Uh, I wasn't born yet. I would, I would be born much later. Sisters Cheche, Nina, and Patty. Uh, Patty is in Boston now. Brothers Bertie and Louie. Okay. And letters, because at the time I father had to travel a lot yeah and he would travel on a pal flight from manila to san francisco for it says only 35 hours between manila to guam to hawaii to uh, los i guess san francisco right he would send home 20 dollar traveler's checks to ease the pain and at the time my mother was a fledgling clinical psychologist at pwu philippine women's university at the time, she was the head of the a place called the Institute of Human Adjustment, which is politically incorrect. It was, it was later developed, uh, renamed Institute of Human Relations. Curiously, uh, my mother would always tell my dad, please mail stamps in your next mail. At that time, Filipinos could use American stamps to mail Filipino letters to America. I love you, darling, Fanny, Louie, I miss you terribly. You know, these were the days, yeah? Uh, double income family, five kids, yeah? My father was an engineer at the time working for the San Miguel Corporation. They were going to start a paper plant in Bislig, Surigao. So he had to go to Wisconsin 
and Georgia in the 50s to train, to make paper. And, oh, sorry. And buy a second-hand car for the family because our first car was breaking down. He bought a second-hand Dodge, which he was going to bring back to the Philippines through the port of Baltimore. So he would drive from Georgia to Baltimore, but on the way, and this is where we start our story, passes by Washington, D.C. My dearest, I'm here at the child phone. This is where he starts to reminisce, yeah? I passed Meridian Park, but didn't stop. Meridian Park is on 16th Street. Um, this is where they had dates. I went to our church and prayed. I parked the car and walked back to the Kennesaw drugstore. This is in the Kennesaw apartments, which are still up there on 16th Street. Yeah? Even your shoe repair shop is still there still. Uh, if you were in some special way transplanted here, you would find everything so familiar. I heard mass at our church at 10 o'clock. I remember all too, where, too well our wedding there. I prayed for you, my darling, and I thought to myself, what a wonderful wife I now have. More than I ever imagined. Washington truly has something for me that no other city has. This city, I leave for you. Here, I met my dear wife, Wood, proposed and married her. You can imagine uh, how I walk step by step, retracing those that I took with you. When we lose one another, and this I do not want to think about, let us think of the nice memories. But let us always look ahead. As someone else has said, and he took this from Thomas Wolfe, let, look forward, angel. Yeah. Uh, love you, Louis. I love you, darling. Tom. Um, my father had 10 years to live. He would die in a plane crash in this league, uh, inspecting that paper plant that I had shown you he was preparing for. Uh, my mother was widowed, six children and a uh, single mom, uh, but she looked forward. She was an incurable optimist, yeah? Uh, she later became a, the Secretary of Social Welfare, the first cabinet minister woman. She became a secretary, Assistant Secretary General for UNICEF and UNESCO. Um, she, she died uh, about uh, 15 years ago, yeah? But I will tell you a story about my mom. Uh, one time we were going to ride a plane to Palawan and there must have been 15 of us. We would take up almost all the whole plane because it was a small plane. And as we were boarding, my mother goes nonchalantly to us. She says, uh, um, oops, sorry, revealed the, uh, no. uh, I, I said to her, she said to us, you know what? A plane like this crashed last week and it, everybody died. <laughs> we all look at her and say, what? And she goes, she looks at us and says, what? It could happen, right? So she was fat fatalistic in the sense that, hey, whatever God throws to me, hey, I'll accept. But didn't stop her from looking forward. You know, she's had, what, 25 grandchildren. Um, we, we, are, we are all, you know, um, have our careers. You know? She brought us up by herself. But, you know, she always had daddy because of those love letters now. I wanted to end this talk by saying that this was a different time. I, I, when I saw these letters, you know, in this day and age of Instagram and Facebook and instant ramen, you know, we miss those days where people used fountain pens and wrote in Palmer script. And then, you know, my father would always have a pocket square and wore ties and my mother would wear brooches and, and gloves. You, you don't see that anymore, yeah? And most of all, they wrote each other. They, they wrote each other and they wouldn't expect letters for two weeks. So a lot of the responses were asynchronous. Yeah? And the letters were poignant. Uh, they had to be urgent. They had to be, they were uh, everything you could think of. But the one thing they were not, they were not cynical. They were always hopeful. So I guess I leave you with that note that, you know, those, those good old days, 
we're hopeful times. Uh, not cynical like maybe today. We're so jaded. We're so saturated. But those were innocent times. So this is a, a, a love story about my mom and dad, my grandfather and grandmother, and um, maybe a, a love story for Washington, D.C. It's a city they love. They live there. My grandparents live there. I didn't live there, but this is where shameless plug comes in, just like Rita. No? Uh, my son, Lope, is a dancer for the Washington Ballet. So we would appreciate very much if you could attend his, his uh, shows. I think next season, they're, they're, they're shut down now because of COVID, but next season, they're going to be doing, uh, uh, I think, Swan Lake and, and uh, Nutcracker. And if you care to invite him from time to time to have some adobo and rice in your homes, he would appreciate it because he's on a diet as a dancer, yeah. Um, my, 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 my mother and father were great dancers. Uh, the good Lord did not give me those genes and then passed it instead to my son. So please do watch him. Yeah? So with that, uh, I thank you for listening and um, I will take questions now. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Ricky. Um, this is Rodney Obian and I will be your moderator, or actually uh, Ricky's moderator today uh, or tonight. Um, I would like to ask that if you have any questions, please post them on the chat box and I will read them as I see them. So uh, I'll, start, uh, I'll start the questions with one of my own. Um, could you tell us a, a particular story about your parents or your family in DC that's really memorable to you? I'm, I'm, I'm curious. And, and, and I should say the Mount Pleasant neighborhood, I lived in that neighborhood. I know 18th Street. I was, I lived, my apartment was there. So, um, so it was, it was uh, quite remarkable to see the picture of them there. But uh, any, any particular stories that, uh, that stand out to you? Um, well, um, my mother always said that uh, they had, what, three dates. The first date was when she, they met at the apartment. The second date was in that, a hotel in Philadelphia, and the third date was their wedding day. So, you know, it was uh, letters and phone calls and long distance and wedding, you know? She always remembers that. She, she never forgets how, uh, how excited they both were, yeah? Oh, another story that I had to tell is that uh, my grandfather, Ama Lolo Amado, who was the father of my mother, was devastated that she would marry without his consent and basically wouldn't want to communicate until my mother sent pictures of her two new daughters, Cheche and Nina, uh. in which case my grandfather melted and said, okay, you can come back. <laughs> basically, I want to see them, so you're now back in the fold. No? But for, the, for a long while, she was uh, persona non grata in the family. Oh. That, that, sorry, did I answer your question, Rod? I think so. I, um, um, let me ask you one of the, uh, so there are a couple of questions in the chat box. Uh, first question is from Henry. And Henry asks, a military career uh, was highly unusual for a Chinoy in those years. Um, and what made General Lim choose his path? I think it was his teach. It were his. It was his teachers in Philippine Normal College. He was already a graduate of college, and he was teaching in a public school. Uh, the teachers told him, "Hey, you know, Lim, you're you're a good athlete." He was a baseball player, Rita, FYI. Uh, he was a boxer, and he was pretty good at math. And so they said, "Why don't you take the exam?" So eighteen kids took the exam. Seventeen of them failed, and he was the only one. And uh, the governor general said, are we going to send this guy because he's too old? And they had a backup plan. They had a, a Filipino uh, in living in Iowa at the time who was going to be Filipino number one. But then uh, you know, he was kind of just uh, not so much forced, but I think he was convinced that, hey, maybe this is a good career to have. Yeah? So he never thought of being a military man. You know? Although, Rod, yeah. uh, Let's back up a few years. Sure, During sure. the Philippine-American War, he was still young. He was only 12 years old. But he was a runner for the Filipino uh, guerrillas fighting the American army. 
So in that sense, he was kind of steeped in war. He wasn't a soldier, but he would run back and forth between the front lines. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. Uh, frankly, we don't know what motivated him. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there's another story, Rod. Uh, so this day, because of my grandfather's stint in uh, Washington, the Lim family eats uh, roast beef American style, which is rare. No, which is unusual in the Philippines because in the Philippines, uh, most Filipinos tend to incinerate their beef. Okay, uh, and then so when Filipinos come to our our uh, dinners, they are so shocked because the the meat is red, and that's the way the general taught us to to eat. That's a that's a habit he had picked up from the Americans. Yeah. Uh. Thank you. Uh, th so there's an another question about uh, your grandfather. Um, it's, yeah. I believe, sure, Sheila. Um, and she says, as a Philam West Point graduate, the Lim family is special. One qu question, what is your, why is there no memorial of General Lim at West Point? There um, is a, sorry, Rod, there is a minor, um, Sheila, minor exhibit in the museum, I believe. Uh, dedicated to General Lim, it's a small display. It's not a uh, it's not a big statue, but it's a small display. Uh, another trivia: If you watch the Long Gray Line, it's directed by John Ford with mm -hmm. Maureen O'Hara. In the last scene of the movie, they actually credit Vicente Lim as the first Filipino graduate of uh, of West Point. Yeah. They also misspelled his name. It was Vincente, like a, like in Italian. Vincente Lim, yeah. So he was not only a cannibal, but they misspelled his name, yeah. Um, I, so there is a, a Sheila, a small exhibit, uh, and that's fine. I think that's that's cool. I'm, I'm thinking whether she if she's um, suggesting we have something a little bigger. So um, I'm. I myself have been a big fan of your grandfather. Yeah. yeah, so um, uh, there's a request here to introduce your siblings. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, who have joined you. Um, I don't know if there are all 100 of them, that you, as you mentioned earlier. but uh, Probably only about 90. Okay. <laughs> um, my, my sister, Patty. Patty, if you could just unmute and say hi. Yeah, if, if, if some of the Lim family could... Um, Introduce yourselves. I guess I think people in the audience would appreciate. My brother Louis is here. Brother Bertie. There are yeah, my, uh, my cousin Yeva. She's the daughter of Roberto, the son number two. Yeah, she, her father was the one who. Her mother resold my mom's wedding gown, and her father went back after the war to find the general. Yeah. Yeah, Nieves, yeah, Nieves with, me. and my sister Nina. She was the one that allowed my mother to come back into the fold of my grandfather when he had disowned her, my mother, yeah. Mm. Ricky, um, good job, Ricky. We love you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hi, my name is Peche. Hi. My name is Peche. I'm the, I'm the eldest of... Uh, Louis and Fanny's family. Mm. Ricky's our baby. <laughs> Good job, baby. <laughs> I'm Louis, the junior. The only junior, hopefully. Hi. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, let's see. There's another question from uh, uh, Kate. Uh, did your grandfather talk about the Spanish-American War or the Philippine War? Um, did he communicate any opinion about Americans or the Spanish? No. Uh, you can go to everybody of the limbs. I mean, I, I think everyone can. You know, so. yeah. well, go ahead, I, Ricky. Sorry. My, my brothers, uh, my siblings, and my cousin might interject. I don't believe he corresponded about that war. His correspondence was more about his relationship with MacArthur mm -hmm. and the then uh, young Philippine army 
and his dealings with MacArthur and Eisenhower. Um, Ike Eisenhower, by the way, was one class below him, 1915. And according to the history books, Eisenhower declared Lim to be a difficult person to work with, but a good man. You know, Eisenhower said that of my, and um, my grandfather had frequent visits. So to VFW 5471, uh, you know that my grandfather had numerous disagreements uh, with the general, but at the end of the, at the start of the war, he declares that, well, he is my commanding general. I will follow him. So he said, I'm, you know, he's, he's a good commander. I'm going to follow him. Yeah. That doesn't, that didn't mean that he always agreed with him, but he, he was a good soldier. Yeah. Um, let's see. Thank you. Um, a question of mine, and it's particular to your grandmother, uh, Pilar. Yes. Um, she was an active supporter of the suffrage movement and president of the National Federation of um, Women's, the Women's Club in the Philippines. Did, did you, did they ever talk, did she, or did you get any stories about um, her um, involvement with the suffrage movement um, in the Philippines? Mm. Maybe my, my my sisters or my cousin can speak to that. Nieves, Cheche, did you ever talk about suffrage? Nieves. Um, we were too young to <laughs> even realize that she was even important. She was only Lola to us and she just taught us algebra. So uh, we didn't know about her activities uh, because she was just playing Lola to us. And we we're just learning about all this well um, through the years and since we've had to collect and do some activities in their honor. Yeah. Thank you. I think my brother Bertie. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Lola Pilar led the suffrage movement in the Philippines. And wasn't there a picture of her where she and uh, some other suffrage? I would like to share an in something about Lolo and MacArthur. Okay, thank you. You know, uh, MacArthur wanted to justify his uh, title of Field Marshal of the Philippine Army. You know, he, he gave up his uh, U.S. Army. He resigned from the U.S. Army to become field marshal of a uh, non-existent Philippine army. Now his approach was to come up, his vision was to come up with 400,000 reserves from nothing, from zero. And this frustrated Eisenhower, who was his uh, chief of staff at that time. Because Eisenhower felt it was more realistic to train a small but well-led army and this required putting the resources into training uh, officers and uh, getting good uh, equipment because the United States uh, was uh, giving the Philippine army obsolete equipment even at that time. Anyway, um, uh, Eisenhower was so frustrated that uh, he, you know, because of uh, Mark Arthur's egotism that he quit MacArthur and went back to the United States. My, my grandfather agreed with Eisenhower and had all these, uh, I guess, disagreements with MacArthur such that uh, uh, the, according to Carlos P. Romulo, who was the uh, a journalist at that time, he quoted Quezon, he said, you know, that fellow Lim is the only one who's got cojones. The only one with both. Uh, so, so uh, I think my grandfather couldn't, didn't suffer fools, uh, mm -hmm. and he, he said so in even in his letters to his son. You know, there's a book about uh, the letters of his, uh, his, the letters he wrote to my father and his two brothers, and that that uh, that book tells a lot about my grandfather. That's it. <laughs> If I may add, Rod, there's sure. another book by. Okay. If I may add, Rod, there's a book by I think his name is Richard Mixell. He's mm -hmm. a historian, and he wrote writes that uh, Lim would 
uh, berate not only Filipinos but American soldiers. Mm -hmm. He would make American soldiers uh, salute to him because he was a, an officer. You know? So he was uh, quite a combative man. Maybe that, to answer your first question, maybe that's mm -hmm. what got him into the army because he just loved sort of confronting people. So there were some soldiers who said, this, not the guy I want to cross swords with because uh, he wow. was a scary guy. <laughs> but, you know, a loving father, nevertheless, yeah. yeah. Did he have any stories about his time in West Point, your grandfather? Um, yeah, that he yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe you could share that with us? Uh, well, one day Quezon visited around 1913 to, to see his soldiers. At the time, there were already other Filipinos, right? And when Quezon says to the younger sold, uh, Filipino uh, uh, West Pointers, uh, where is Lim? And then the soldiers would say, sir, he's, uh, there's a term for it in West Point where you're penalized, you have to march in the square uh, to do like, you know, back, you know, like pe penance, you know? And it was because Lim was always defending the younger Filipinos. Um, he was always yeah. trying to being very combative. And so he would get demerits and made to march in the square of West Point uh, as punishment. <laughs> Uh, some of the West Pointers here might know what that is, but it's a, it was a penalty that uh, uh, he would suffer. Yeah? He was a good bridge player, Rod. He was uh, known to be a crackerjack bridge player. Uh, and uh, I guess I would imagine he was a gambler uh, in the sense that he, was, he would like to take risks. He used his math to, to great advantage. Yeah? So... Uh, so during West Point, he was regarded as good in math, good in Spanish, mm -hmm. but not so good in the other subjects. <laughs> he graduated 77th mm -hmm. and said later on, well, you know, I was the only Filipino graduate, so I didn't try too hard because I would, I would be the only Filipino graduate anyway. He could have done better, but he said, why, did, why do I try so hard? Yeah, He was very human, I guess, Rod. Uh, you know, of course... We would like to make heroes, hagiography, hey, we'd like to make heroes out of them. But uh, I guess what makes it more exciting for, for us, Kasi, is that he was just human, like everybody else, you know. He would tell Kazon, I'm going to fight to the last man. Oh, and can you please tell my wife I'm okay? You know, that, that kind of, you know, you don't see that kind of, you, know, <laughs> you don't see that in movies. Yeah? Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, oh. Another incident in Bataan was he knew that it was going to be a long slog and asked the American quartermaster for all the supplies they could provide. So they gave it to him, trucks and trucks of food, you know, which they would later use in the war. And when one of the U.S. Army inspectors came around and said, why do you have all of this equipment, this, this uh, food? This is no good. So Lim comes down and starts to shout at him, tells him to go away, probably in very colorful language, and basically telling them, this is my army, you know, don't interfere, I need these guys to fight. No? And indeed, they, they probably were the, the, one of the, according to history, uh, the Japanese were actually scared to fight the 41st, mm. because the 41st were, were very fierce, no? Mm -hmm. And in fact, General Lim actually had a plan because the Japanese army rested around March 1942 because they were a little spent. And the, the general had a plan to bypass them and retake San Fernando. Oh. And he was waiting for orders and they never came. Yeah. So, uh, so the 41st was very renowned. It was regarded as one of the best fighting units uh, that the Japanese later saluted and said, you know, we were a little bit scared. <laughs> Uh, about that, that fighting that unit, yeah. Oh, wow, well, thank, thank you. Uh, um, I think to follow up, like, I guess it's more related to your uh, grandfather, Sonny Busa, hello Sonny, um, asked a question, how did the Lim family tradition of passing rank insignia to the PMA graduates originate? Um, and he says, I have assisted the Lim family with this ceremony. Um, it was my 
grandmother. Of course, by this time, she'd come back to the Philippines. Uh, my grandfather at the time was teaching at the Baguio Military Academy when they met. Baguio Military Academy became PMA mm. and was later, he was later a, a superintendent. And so that my grandmother back in mid 50s decided it would be a tribute to her husband if she would distribute the first lieutenants, uh, I think they're called VICs, their uh, insignia uh, for graduates who will become second lieutenants in the Philippine Armed Forces. No? So every year she would trudge up to Baguio and hand these out to young cadets. Yeah? So, you know, for the last, uh, oh, 70 years, we've continued that tradition. So it's on the fourth or fifth generation now that wow. we continue to do so. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a family tradition. We, we do it every year. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this year, we couldn't do it for the first time because of COVID. There was no physical contact. So we had to do everything by, by mail. Uh, but normally, two or three of us are up there handing out uh, insignia to the mm -hmm. cadets. Yeah? It's a wonderful tradition. Um, <laughs> uh, David has a question. Um, what was... General Lim's relationship with President Laurel, what did he think of him? <laughs> uh, privately, they were okay. Mm -hmm. He knew that Laurel was a puppet who had no choice. No. Publicly, Laurel asked him to, after being released from Capas, Laurel asked him to be a general in the new Philippine army under the, Jap the Japanese government. And he refused. He he said no. I don't. I will not be willing to participate. No. Um, but actually, I believe they were almost kababayan uh, because Laurel was from Tanawan, Batangas, uh, and nearby was Kalamba Laguna. So I don't think they had any personal animosity towards each other. So he knew that Laurel was a puppet. He had no choice, no? and that that was it. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, Abdul um, asked a question. Uh, can you tell us about your grandmother's uh, decision to return to the Philippines in 1946? And was there a thought about just staying in the United States? No, she, uh, she felt her place was in the Philippines. Uh, oh, she was, uh, uh, she was a uh, wartime minister for Sergio Osmeña, Osmeña asked her to come back also. But I believe she also felt that uh, all of her sons were going back, uh, that she should raise the remaining family in the Philippines. So, no, there was never a thought, uh, you know, she, uh, I don't think she ever, she thought that America was temporary. She mm -hmm. felt that the Philippines was her place, yeah. yeah. So. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, and I forgot the, the last question, and I think we need to wrap it up. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a message that I, I should let you get back to your day. Um, um, any, uh, any words of wisdom to impart um, from the family to those um, here joining us, um, some 100 or so, not all your relatives, but um, um, yeah. from, from the Lim family. I think people would appreciate sort of a, some words of wisdom. Um, well, uh, again, m maybe my, my thoughts are about having hope, uh, banishing cynicism, yeah? We're so easy to be negative and cynical, jaded, and quick to brush things off uh, when we should be looking forward. Uh, as my mother said, well, the plane might crash and I'm gonna die. <laughs> so what? I mean, we gotta continue to build, yeah? So we feel the same in the Philippines. We, we got to move forward. You know, just smile and, bear and, and, and gr grin and bear it, yeah? So I think maybe that's what I'm projecting, of course. Maybe that's what the general, my grandmother, my father, mother would, would try to impart. Say, you know, when, when things are down, forget about it, you know? Smile and then move forward, no? My, my mother would save stamps and she would be down to her last $20 trying to raise six kids, no? Uh, my grandfather would write from the battlefield like, hey, you know, paper scars, you know. And General Casson, can Manuel Cass, can you please lend my mother, my wife, some money? All that didn't detract from the fact that 
they were there was a good life ahead. Yeah. So I hope I can leave that message with young people. Thank you. That was thank you very much. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you to the Lim family. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you to those in our audience who joined us tonight and for your questions. Um, and uh, stay tuned. Um, we have other uh, Historia online DC programs planned. Again, so good night and, or, or good morning, wherever you are. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you, everybody. That was amazing. Thank you, Rod Rodney. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Rita. Thank you, Ricky. That was terrific. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. It was an honor. Uh, okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Rod. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye everybody. Bye, Bye, Irwin. Bye, Ricky. Bye. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much, Ricky. You're welcome. Goodbye. Thank you. Okay. Erwin, do you want us to stay on a little bit, or are you um, and the battery call at night, or or do you want us to go into your other room? Um, uh, we can stay, um, or uh, uh, you know the other room, so we can meet there. Okay. How do you get to the other room? <laughs> uh, I look at a previous email. Um, oh, yes. oh, all right. Um, today. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Me too. <laughs> Thanks, Rita. Signing off. Okay. Take All care. Right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Manong Ray. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.